Ah, oh, hello. So I'm here with uh, Peter Clark, uh, curator of the Silicon 100 uh, report, which uh, E Times produces every year. Peter, hello. Hello, Nitin. So, uh, Peter, um, you've been doing this for a few years. Tell me what are the key highlights of this year's Silicon 100, 2023? Okay. Um, yes, we're, we're, I think this is the 19th year that we've done the Silicon 100. And uh, it's about the fourth since we went from 60 companies to, to 100 companies. And, and this year, there's, there's three particular things that I, I highlight. One is continued high levels of interest in artificial intelligence startups that are trying to address various aspects of that market. Uh, a second uh, highlight is a significant surge in highly funded Chinese startup activity. And I would say the third trend is the fact that the, the wave front for startups is becoming uh, a lot broader. Um, so in all sorts of areas from power semiconductors through displays, materials, and so on, we're seeing a lot of uh, early startup activity. Well, I, I think uh, that's quite interesting because uh, two years ago when we did this chat, you said, oh, uh, has AI peaked? And you thought it maybe had. <laughs> uh, what's the verdict now? Um, well... It hadn't. Uh, yeah, um, we were seeing um, that, that AI companies, startups have been around for, for quite a while. There were a lot of them appearing on in the wild and, and in the Silicon 100. And I was starting to think that um, uh, the time for a shakeout was approaching. But I think with, with hindsight, we can see that um, the high levels of interest in, in, in even more complex uh, machine learning algorithms, deep learning, whatever you want to call it, chat GPT, is, is going to drive a, another pulse of AI startup activity. Um, we're also seeing that um, a lot of the early startups were, were trying to address uh, big data, data centers, a lot of algorithms which were being written for the data center. We're now starting to see that move towards AI at the edge which is a much more varied mm. and rich environment. So that, that creates a lot of opportunities, of application-specific opportunities. So, you know, if anything, the, the level of interest and the number of startups that are particularly being formed to address AI, AI has gone up again, and, and I, I think it's going to carry on for a few more years. Uh, and maybe we were lo looking forward uh, to, to quantum computing as being the next thing, and, and I... I suppose I would have to say that that is still a little bit further away. It's a probably end of this decade uh, type thing. Yeah, that's still, I mean, it's a lot of research. I, I think probably you've, I'm not sure if you had highlighted any in, in the Silicon 100, but I think um, there, that's still a lot of research and there are some, some funding in that area as well. Yeah, I think we have six uh, quantum computing companies on uh, on the Silicon 100. Uh, but yeah, a lot of that work is still sort of small volumes of, of, of chip numbers, prototype devices, demonstrators, and a lot of it's being shared with other R&D engineers and with academics. There, there is not yet that killer application where suddenly everybody is saying this is where we can sell high volumes of, of, of chips or systems. But you're also seeing a lot of overlap with photonics and, and, and AI. So these are all highly promising and interconnected areas which are gradually thrusting themselves and, and, and adjacent markets forward. Yeah, I think um, we, we were going to address that later, but I'll ask now anyway. But there's a there's a whole continuum of applications which now, you know, you, there's not really that much demarcation from one to the other unless you... Uh, you know, you can label it one way, but it's actually doing a lot of other things as well. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose uh, another sort of sub-trend uh, that we're seeing in the Silicon 100 and the startup activity is um, there is a, a, a tendency towards full stack, what's called full, full stack offering, which will include yeah. optimized hardware, firmware, software, algorithms, printed circuit, you know, sort of boards or modules uh, and possibly systems, even services. We used to have a very well-developed um, industry that was uh, a lot of um, uh, segregation. You, you, you'd have uh, 
chips would chip companies would sell to board companies, board companies would sell to computer companies. Yes. The complexity of technology these days means that uh, you need that deep understanding of uh, the algorithms and the software to be able to optimize the hardware, and it's easiest to do that, you know, in, 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 under under one roof. Yeah, and I think you know, that's what I keep hearing from a lot of companies now when they brief us. Yeah, so it's the full stack. Yeah, we do the full stack. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, right up to communications and you know the the hardware accelerators and all that. Yeah. Let's focus on the startup scene in general. Um, what's the direction of travel? You know, where, where are we heading? And you know, sort of both trends-wise as well as uh, polit- uh, geographically. Okay. Well, um, we've discussed AI and how that is uh, yep. starting to grab a slightly larger share of, of, of the hundred. Um, We've also seen in in recent years a lot of, uh, for example, wide band gap semiconductor activity at materials level and power device level. Um, mm. That's still well represented. Um, I suppose in the marketplace we've started to see the big companies start to really scale up. Um, you know, the, the STs, the Wolf Speed, um, and uh, Infineon and others. Uh, and that starts to put a bit of, you know, they're acquiring startup companies to help them address that. But but it's starting to put a bit of pressure back on some of those uh, uh, WBG companies. Display activity is is very rich around micro LED. I mean, there was uh, the expectation that Apple would move to micro LED. I, I think they went with OLED in their recently announced um uh, virtual reality headset. But the expectation is they will go to micro LED. Um, there's a lot of hope uh, and uh, activity around micro LED displays, which of course are, are uh, right. emissive and generally considered to be superior to a lot of the previous technologies. And we're seeing all of that activity. Um, there is undoubtedly a tremendous uh, entrepreneurial in interest, particularly forming startup companies. What we've seen a little bit less of in the last year is the larger amounts of VC money for scale-up. Um, I think there's still plenty of startups being created. Um, uh, the, the scale-up has turned down slightly, and I think the the the, the sort of uh, global economy is struggling. The geopolitics is creating some uncertainty uh, around the world. And I think that is hurting some of the startups that have been around for a while and now coming back for, for, you know, asking for some major amounts of money. Um, there's this little bit of pressure there, particularly in, in the West, less so in China. I mean, that's the other thing that um, I mentioned at the top uh, of the interview is we've seen um, enormous numbers of Chinese startups, particularly fabulous chip companies, addressing all of these markets, digital and analog. I, I, according to a German think tank in, in Berlin, which did a sort of uh, study based on all the data they could get over the last three years, 20 to 22, the, the level of activity yeah. in China uh, over this time has been, I think they said, three times the level of activity in the US and six times the level of activity in the European Union. That's a lot of startup companies, <laughs> uh, yeah. many of whom will be hoping to gain access to leading edge silicon through foundries. So you can see how the geopolitics mm. starts to intrude there. Well, I think uh, one thing you said to me uh, in our sort of pre-chat is, um, you know, there's a big rise in, for example, automotive and uh, in China uh, startups and you know, requirement for advanced silicon. And then how is that going to play I'm not going to ask you the geopolitical question, but yeah, you know, that's going to have some impact. Yeah, I mean, they, they they were probably expecting that they could go to TSMC, they could go to Global Foundries, they could go to uh, Samsung and get, you know, seven nanometer, five nanometer, three nanometer silicon made. Uh, we know last year that one particular Chinese company, Byron Technology, which had a complex AI chip, that uh, GPU-style AI chip that they thought could compete with NVIDIA, was effectively denied access to, to TSMC. Uh, and SMIC, which is the leading digital foundry in China, 
can make 40 nanometer silicon. It is said they are they can perhaps get down to seven nanometer without using EUV, but it, it's not clear that they have a, 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 a strong ability to produce at that level. So uh, I, I think, you know, despite this, this pulse of activity in China, a lot of those startups, you know, the ones that are addressing the digital leading edge are, are going to be hoping that they can, you know, effectively they have, they have to, you know, seek permission to gain access to, to leading edge technology, which is a, a difficult situation for them. There are mm. plenty of other Chinese startups, of course, which are addressing analog silicon or power semiconductors yeah. or other, you know, which are a long way behind the digital leading edge and, and they will uh, continue to to act, uh, to yeah. take part in the industry. I mean, I think one other point I would make about the Chinese startups is they do divide into two categories that are some that are very obviously and uh, focused on being domestic suppliers that have little interest in the, the broader market. And there are others who okay. are truly global and, and, you know, they're multinational in their locations and they, they wish to address a, a global market. Yeah, so it's a, good, it's a good observation. Let's go back to, and I think we touched on it a little bit, but um, you, you talked about the full stack. But uh, this year, uh, uh, 2023, there's a huge bandwagon uh, riding on, on the back of AI, a lot of uh, VC money going into it, a lot of frenzy. I'm not sure uh, that it's the same as the the, the dot-com boom of you know, the 2000s. Or uh, I think there's, 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 there's that hype but there's also a lot of depth underneath it and not everybody's really an ai company but they're doing lots of things using ai so but they're using ai as their marketing term to sort of get it get on that bandwagon to get the investment any observations um well i, th I think you're absolutely right nitin um uh, i think the thing you have to remember is that uh, ai is a blanket term there is a continuum of activity from software that is uh, or algorithms that are, are, are very marginally machine learning things which can you know slightly adapt um, to data input to things which are neural networks and the various architectures that we've, we've heard of around those to to these very complicated uh, transformer algorithms with 16 billion parameters and, and so on that that really heavy computational systems um, so there's a broad continuum a, a lot of the activity will be down uh, at the you know the more gentle pattern recognition type stuff and um, a lot of the times you know you'll barely be aware that a bit of AI was used just to shave five percent off the energy consumption here or to s speed up development time yes. of, of, a, of a chip you know it's not that we have an automated intelligence that just suddenly sits down and designs a chip. We have a you know classical yeah. EDA flow where um, software modules have been added to or tweaked or amended to uh, handle you know large data sets to improve uh, debug uh, coverage and and all of these little incremental benefits add up to a, to a much larger benefit. At the same time, I'm sure there are some companies that just you know are just keen to you know kind of say they've got ai whether it's in software or in hardware or, or not really there at all so caveat emptor you know you, you have to uh, take all of these claims with uh, and, and be prepared to verify them okay well peter thank you I, I don't know whether there's any last sort of thought you want to give otherwise um, you know this has been quite an interesting discussion it seems like ai is is featuring now in that silicon 100 list and you know it's still sort of got a long way to go yeah i mean it, it has featured for a while and uh it, it has continued vigor and i think it's going to be present for a long time at some point there will be a shakeout at some point um either mainstream semiconductor companies or or the the, the big hyperscalers and the, the the big you know the googles the the netflix the uh metas will Meta. perhaps start to yeah. uh define and dominate these markets and that may be the point at which the startups uh, either get acquired or go away but for the next few years 
I think AI is the big digital opportunity, and I think it's going to be very pervasive. Um, but there are plenty of other analog and uh, and materials and uh, I/O and mm. display type opportunities. Quantum is there in the in the, the more distant future. Well, you need, you still need that interface to the real world. So yes, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Nissin.